If you were driving through the neighborhood and saw something like this, you might wonder what on earth is a huge steam engine doing in a place like this? Come inside with me and we'll get some answers. I'm talking to Faith Blue. Faith is the manager of the Lamita Railroad Museum. And I'm sure when people drive by and see this huge engine here, <laughs> I mean, what on earth do they say and think? Do they come inside and say, what is this? Absolutely. Because you don't see a train every single day in a residential area. And there's a long background and history to this. Our founder, Mrs. Irene Lewis, built this museum. She lives where, her home used to be where the parking lot is and where the grassy area is, is where her factory Little Engines used to be. Little Engines manufactured the kits for these um, one and a half inch scale trains that people assemble and ride. There's a group called the Live Steamers. As a tribute to her late husband, Mr. Martin Lewis, and her passion for the steam locomotive, she built this museum. About what year was that? She built it in 1965 and opened it to the public in 1966. Did people want, I mean, did she have much trouble getting hold of a train? Um, she had a little bit of trouble. She purchased this train for scrap. It was heading for the scrap yard because the era for steam locomotives was was dying. It was, it was turning over and transitioning to diesel. So she purchased this for scrap, restored the train. Southern Pacific was purchased by Union Pacific. Union Pacific, in turn, gave her the caboose as a Christmas gift. So she kind of got a two for one deal. I know that you weren't here at that time, but when when the neighbors saw this su super huge steam engine come, I mean, do you have any recollection or do you know what kind of a reaction was? I, well, I think there was enthusiasm. People who come to the museum and who knew Mrs. Lewis knew that she was a train expert and, and, uh, and her passion was about trains. So they kind of knew and suspected with Mrs. Lewis anything was possible. And so it was a little bit of a surprise to some people. We have um, pictures, photographs of how the trains were brought here. Um, but again, with Mrs. Lewis, if she could dream it, it would happen, and the neighbors knew to suspect that. One of the uh, wonderful things about steam trains is the incredible collection, if you will, of all these sort of rods and ties and huge wheels. So different from diesel trains today. Uh, do you want to just say a few words about that? Well, I think that what I love sharing with children when they come here for tours is that before the train, before the uh, steam locomotive was uh, built, it took people weeks to get west. When the train was built, our nation explo exploded. It took days to get west. And now with the plane, it takes hours. So that's a really wonderful opportunity to share with them about transportation. You mentioned an interesting thing about the color of this being black. Well, it's not an accident that most locomotives are painted black. Um, there was a lot of soot that came with steam locomotives. And it was a tough, hard job. It's, very, it's romanticized, but you have to remember that it was a lot of hard work. And it was all open to the elements for the engineer and the coal guy. And, and the passengers. I mean, they would talk about clean coal during later in its history. And that was a big deal because if passengers had their windows open, if they were wearing a light colored outfit, it might not be so light colored <laughs> once they were done with their trip. We're standing inside the, uh, I think, fascinating museum here. And Faith, perhaps you could tell us some of the really interesting, I mean, it's all interesting, but tell us some of the specially interesting things that we have here. You bet. One of the things that tells the best about the story of how we even are here is the uh, Utah assembled one and a half inch scale train. These trains were um, from the assembly of the kits that Mrs. Irene Lewis manufactured. These from. were kits? These were made from kits. So the foundry and everything was here on this property. And so this is the source of revenue that built this museum, that purchased the rail cars, that purchased the property across the street, that made this dream come true. Okay. I understand uh, that you have some uh, things, I think, over there displaying one of the things that is missing from many railroads now, and that is eating on board the train. Right. Well, thanks to Fred Harvey, um, he brought restaurants to the West and introduced the idea of a fine meal on your train trip. So this came later, eating on a train came later in the, the uh, steam locomotive's history, but dining became a very formal event. It was 
goes on um, uh, your stoneware and your glassware and silverware and the service plates. It was a big deal. You came dressed up for the occasion. And when you look at some of the menus, they served wine and some of the prices, wouldn't we love to get a meal today for some of those prices? <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that people actually had the, um, I don't know, the foresight to save stuff like this? Absolutely. There's a lot of historical societies. There are hoarders, but there are people who really realize that there are items out there that are important. And if you don't save them, they're gone and they can never be recovered. You were sharing with us just a moment ago a wonderful story about um, how they warned or stopped trains. Could you tell us about sure, that? Sure, you bet. Among our collection, we've got things for children and we have um, items that appeal more to a, a mature audience. We have a torpedo over in our display case. Actually, a torpedo? I'm uh, thinking of the Navy. You would, wouldn't you? We have a couple of them, actually. And what they were, they were a device that they set on the rail um, from the previous train to forewarn the upcoming train that there was something up ahead and there was a need to stop. And so these would make a sound and a little bit of a smoke and it would warn the train that there was a reason to, to stop the train. You mentioned kids. What sort of age uh, would you recommend kids coming here? Well, you know... I'm a kid basically at heart. <laughs> <aren't> so <we> <laughs> all? Um, I really believe that the museum appeals to all ages. The trains outside are allowed, the children are allowed to go in and explore. If they've never been inside of a 1902 Southern Pacific steam locomotive, they get to look inside the firebox, really explore that and get to feel what it was like to be a, an engineer or a fireman. Um, there's a water tower right next to it, so they really get that sense of height and the wheels, the size of the wheels. Then we have a 1910 um, Woodside Union Pacific caboose, and in that, the caboose was made before running water and electricity. Can we so, see that? Absolutely, you bet. So we appeal to a little bit of everybody. Inside the museum is probably a little bit more for the adults or an older teenager. And, you know, you mentioned kids. I, as a child growing up, loved, as I've shared with you, trains. And I remember my parents reading to me Thomas the Tank Engine. Do you have any sort of stuff where, you know, you read to kids about something? We do. We have a story time that we have on Friday mornings from 9.15 to 10.30. There is an admission for the adults, but all children are free. And they come, and they come aboard our 1910 caboose, and we read them stories. And, and then we give them a tour of the museum. Terrific. Yes.